thank you for being here and uh, listening to me chatting to uh, people today. I say chatting because of course it's not a formal uh, research interview and we're not doing therapy. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Leng, uh, well, thanks for talking to me. Um, I've always wanted to, to have an opportunity to quote Mark Twain. Uh, today I thought, oh, what a funny an opportunity to quote Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, uh, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, narrow-mindedness, all foes of real understanding. Likewise, tolerance, the broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And then Frank Sinatra said uh, uh, about New York, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Okay. Now, we all know you, uh, you just finished your PhD dissertation at the uh, City University of New York. Um, and we'll get to that, you sort of build up to that point. So I think what we'd we like, we'd like to know is sort of the story behind this dissertation, but not just the story behind the dissertation, the story of, of a journey and traveling, not just physical traveling, but some kind of movement of, 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 of mind and spirit and, and, and and so on. So, would you mind to maybe just start telling us a little bit about your your, your personal background, where you come from? <laughs> um, yeah, I I was born and grew up in a little town called Sasselberg in the Free State, and um, yeah, that's where I did all my schooling: primary school, high school until I completed and then came to Pretoria and I've been living in Pretoria and then uh, I don't know how much Did you come to Pretoria to study to study specifically to come to university? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and first time living home, first time from mommy and daddy and And where, where did you go to for university? Were you at Elisa from the beginning? No, I was at the University of Pretoria. And you did uh, what did you study there? I studied a BA um, specializing in psychology and anthropology mm -hmm. and I also did my honors at the university there as well honors in anthropology and psychology oh, really? okay. <laughs> yeah so and then from there I came to Nisa. to do a master's degree in psychology yes I came here to work and then okay. while I was working I enrolled for my master's in psychology okay. so did you get a, a, a lecture, lecture position in, in psychology at Nisa? After your honors, and did, was that the sort of deciding thing? Well, for? I actually, hmm, I started teaching in anthropology. Okay. Before, yeah, I did. I did my undergrad in in psychology, and then I moved immediately after to do um, my honors in psychology, and then I got a call from my professor in anthropology um, asking me to come and assist in anthropology. And I didn't have my honors at the time, so that's actually the reason why I then had to do my honors. So it worked out because I was attending my classes in the evening because the classes were divided, the Afrikaans classes were during the day, the English classes were in the evening. So that worked out well, I guess, in a way for me because then I could teach during the day and attend my classes in the evening. So I then started uh, teaching in anthropology, did my honors in anthropology. And after completing my honors in psychology, I stayed um, in anthropology. Uh, but after a while, I, I, I felt that um, what I wanted to do was psychology. And I wanted a way to go back into psychology. And um, I saw posts advertised at Junisa for uh, lecture, lectureship in psychology. And I decided to apply for it. But what was the reason that, what, what drew you to psychology? What, what Made you leave anthropology to uh, because I went to the university to study psychology in the first place. Yeah, yeah. My passion was in psychology. Studied while I was in high school uh, when we had um, career guidance. Um, I heard about psychology, what it is, what it was about, and it spoke to me. And I found that's what I wanted to do. Um, so when I went to the University of Pretoria, I went there to go and study psychology. But then there was this opportunity to, to also do anthropology, which I knew nothing about before. I only started hearing about it when I got to the university, but found it very interesting and fascinating. And for me, it was linked to psychology and what psychology does as well. So it was not really removed from, from psychology. So I, I saw that opportunity. I took it. Um, 
I mean, I was clearly, I was 20, 21, and so there was still a chance for me to still move uh, from there. So after a while, I decided that I wanted to go back into psychology, and that's what I did. It's interesting to me, you know, a lot of people, and people have different stories about how they end up in psychology, sometimes by default, or because whatever. Mm -hmm. So you say from, from when you were at school, you were drawn to psychology, so but what about psychology got to your interest? Well, I, it's one of those, my, my, my journey, or, you know, the map of where I was going, was in the sciences, the natural sciences, interesting enough. I was part of a, um, a project called Program for Technological Careers. So we had extra lessons that were given in, in, in physics uh, and chemistry. And at school, it was assumed that if you're good in something, that's, that's an obvious route that you're going to take. So I did a lot of that. But um, as part of that, we also did, we were also told about this other field called psychology, but it was more industrial psychology than uh, the psychology that we're doing. And like I said before, I felt drawn to, to psychology and uh, what it was, what it does, uh, what, it, what it was about. And I just felt that that's, that's, it speaks to me, it speaks to who I am, and it's something that I would like to do. So. And, but you weren't drawn specifically to, to the idea of clinical psychology. Yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah. actually, <laughs> like many other people, I, I did try to apply for a whole lot of yeah things. I applied for uh, clinical psychology when I was at the University of Pretoria, and uh, they felt that I needed a bit of life experience. You know, you do your undergrad, you do your honours, and you do your masters. Yeah. Um, I was already in, in the anthropology department actually at the time. I think maybe that's another reason that we've been staying in anthropology for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I applied for clinical psychology because that was the, for me, it was what people did. You yeah. do your undergrad, your honors, and then you, you do your clinical. It was clinical and counseling, you know, research psychology was yeah. not even an option. And um, so I didn't get in into the clinical program because I didn't have enough life experience. And um, after that, I just stayed in anthropology um, and then took a break for a while. And after that, then I came to UNISA. And um, I, I, just, I started teaching uh, in social and community psychology. And uh, I then found my home in, the, in, in, in those fields. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Yeah, it's interesting. I also uh, applied for, after honors, applied for clinical psychology. They told me I need a new personality. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but it's interesting how, one, how one, when you're already in psychology, you actually discover other options right, right. that are actually yeah. more suitable to you. How did that process work for you? How did you discover the, the other kind of psychology that you ended up doing? What, what were the kinds of things in psychology that sort of started? directing you further? I think it's being in, in social psychology and it's, it started or it offered me space to really think critically about things and um, which was a great thing for me I think because then I started rethinking even uh, the possibility of uh, having been in clinical psychology and how that would have worked for me and, and realizing actually that maybe it was a good thing that I, I didn't do clinical psychology because um, that wasn't the, the, the road for me or that wasn't the future for me. And one of the, the, the things that um, I found in, in social psychology um, was that it, it really, what, what we were taught in the theories and how they were presented um, was very problematic for me because of the taking for granted things that were there and uh, that were were taught and that I also now have had to teach. So um, I found my voice in being starting to publish, and also I think another space another space that was offered for me to 
redo or rethink or reimagine was in community psychology where with my colleagues we, we reimagined what community psychology could be, uh, what community psychology uh, can do and how it can be defined and reimagined. So it's through those processes that I felt that this is the kind of psychology that I want to do. Um, and I'm still hoping that um, that can also be realized in social psychology because I feel like it hasn't been realized that much yet. And, and, and you're talking about to reimagine what, what community psychology could be. Can you say something about how you understand uh, community psychology, or at least for you, at least? Um, as an undergrad student studying community psychology, um, again, it was we we had we had a lot of opportunities to go into the communities uh, to do psychology, to work with the people, to offer life skills training, to to work with uh, kids in schools, uh, to work in, in clinics as well. But it was always a recipe type of of uh, engaging with the community because we came and we offered things to the community. And I felt there's, there's so much that was missing there because we, we never really um, offered space or created space to also hear from the people themselves whether that's useful for them or whether that's what they want. And in now, but then I was a student at the time, so I didn't really have much of a say, unfortunately. And as, as a practitioner of community psychology, I felt that um, I'm in a position where that could be done. And that for me was the reimagining part of it. And together with the colleagues, when we were rethinking how community psychology could be, um, we thought um, it should be something that should be defined by people themselves. So we seeing ourselves as the uh, facilitators of, of the project. So in the way in which uh, we design the program as well is in allowing students to bring in also things about how they understand community to be, how they perceive communities to be, and being out there in the community and working with whatever community, what they define as community, is uh, bringing that in, uh, how that could work and how that could be defined. And for me, that's been very enriching. Yeah. Yeah. And your background in anthropology, do you think it sort of provided you with a, a critical place for me to engage with. Definitely, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because there was a, a huge component in, in my anthropology learning on community development. And the, the, the different thing that was happening while I was an anthropology student and a psychology student at the same time, like I said, with psychology, we'd go there, right? And with, with uh, anthropology, we also did go into communities far remote communities, but there then we, we, have, we had engagement sessions with uh, people from the community. And it was very different and very interesting in how we did it in anthropology and we did it in psychology. And I feel that what we did in anthropology also fed the way in which I felt that it, it should or could be in psychology. So definitely the two are connected for me. I also started you working in a psychology department whilst I was still busy doing my master's degree and I did my PhD whilst working. Mm -hmm. did you, and I found it quite challenging, you know, it's like quite a difficult thing to, to do. Did you, did you find it challenging to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to finish your postgraduate work whilst also being a full-time staff member? Yeah, it was. I, I actually started working when I was doing my second year. And, and for me, I, I never really had the chance to, to be a full-time student. I, I was only ever a full-time student when I was doing my first year. And from second year onwards, I, I was working at the university, so I never really had that full-time student feeling. And it was, it was a challenge, especially when I um, started working here at, at Trinista and studying to think about doing, doing my master's. And, um, you know, having your colleagues as your, you know, your colleague as a supervisor as well, and re-establishing the relationship or redefining the relationship, um, but also having to juggle between work and all the assignments that we have to mark, and also focusing on this baby that is your thesis that you have to do as well, uh, was a bit of a challenge. But I think it takes a lot of discipline to be able to do that. But it's not an easy thing actually.
it wasn't for me. Yeah. Mm. So, maybe, what, what made it possible for you to successfully complete the masters? You know? Do you have any kind of is it just pure luck or you know, <laughs> <laughs> determination, or do you have any kind of a, advice thing to do to give people? I just doing it. You just you know you, you just have to do it. You need to make a decision that you decided that you want to do this project, uh, you decided to embark on this journey, and you have to see it through. And I, and I gave myself uh, you know, a, a, a time frame as well, that I want to, to complete this within you know, this specific period of time, and I worked towards that. And, and I think doing that for myself helped me as well. Um, and of course, having support of, of other people in your life also helps me in that. Uh, when you're reminded that you need to be focusing you know, on chapter two or writing or reading. So that, that really helped. But, but for me, just not procrastinating because that's the worst thing that you can do to yourself. But actually doing it, delaying and delaying. Before you know it, it's five years down the line and you're still busy with a project. And so, yeah. And what was your master's degree and your master's thesis about? That's so long ago, I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just choose to forget. Um, I, it was about um, exploring identity or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, exploring self identity in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. and um, I looked at two workplaces. So it was an auto ethnography type of thing. So I was part of the study myself, and um, it was UNISA as a workplace, and it was at the time when the mergers were were taking place when I, when I started, and so. There, there, there were a lot of changes taking place. Of course, I mean, simple things like um, emails being sent in English, because apparently before it was, the emails were just sent out in Afrikaans, Intercom was in Afrikaans, I think. So now, simple changes like those where uh, people now had to, to re-establish and, and deal with the changes that were taking place. Um, so what, what that meant for them, what the merger meant for them, the changes that were taking place meant for them, and me just uh, entering the system as well, and trying to also find myself within the system and my own self-identity in, 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 in the new system and having to establish relationships with colleagues. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was very interesting, like the issues of language, the issues of race, and how that played in all of that. Uh, the changes that were taking place, and um, just uh, collected people's stories uh, uh, about that. And the other aspect of the study uh, was about um, the catwalk as a place of work. So I was looking at the at the modeling industry as well. Um, as another part of my life. Yeah. So as so that for me was also a workplace because I worked in that industry. And, and UNISA as a, as, as a workplace as well. So it is the metaphor of UNISA as a catwalk also, uh, with academics, you know, strutting their stuff in that, uh, in that catwalk, and, and looking at the experiences there as well, because there are a lot of challenges in, in that space. And again, looking at, then bringing them together, and looking at self-identity and how people uh, create that or define themselves within those spaces, within, within that catwalk, yeah. and the challenges that they come across in that catwalk. So, yeah, it's about place that it's Okay. Yeah. Mm. And I'm also interested in, you know, obviously the, the major thing one gets from doing a master's is you get a master's, but I'm always interested in if, if people get more out of their, their research than just the degree. Would you say you, you know, it meant more to you than just the degree? Did you get anything from it? Uh, either in terms of your understanding of you know, the workplace or your experience of it, or publications or anything like that? I think um, it it assisted me to because I was it, it's things that were that I was a part of it it it, it offered me a better understanding of uh, the environment that I was working in um, in the conversations 
um, which is wonderful. My colleagues are very open in, in, in talking about the, the experiences, the challenges, and the changes that are taking place. Because the people who've been working here um, since 1970, since 1975, and you're thinking of someone, um, and how, how, was, how was that like being here in this space in 1975 and being in this space in 2005? And, and those challenges, and, and me finding myself here in 2005, um, my experiences and, and the next person's experiences are not the same, but what is it that I can draw from that? So I, I felt like I learned a lot in that. And in the, in, on the other hand, with, with, with the modeling industry, thinking about the challenges that I experienced personally, but then talking to other models as well, it was interesting to see how the uh, similarities in that, but also depending on who was talking, that, that also yeah, determined the, the experiences also. And, and did that, I mean, would, you, would you think that the, there's, there's more general value in, in seeing research as something that's not just technically about topics, but, but, a, but a process of self-exploration? Definitely. I think in, in uh, most of the work that we do, I, when you think about it, there's so many things that one could do research on, but you, you, you choose that specific topic. And for me, it's very interesting, that's the story that I do. Why this specific topic? How did you end up here at this point where you are? And for me, I think it's always connected to something about you as a person. So I don't think we can really remove ourselves from the research that we do, or the topics that we choose to do research on. Mm. So what about you made you decide on your uh, master's topic, if you had to theorize yourself for a minute? <laughs> um, well, I was, I was interested in, in, in how people deal with the change at UNISA. Um, it, it was a time of frustration for a lot of people. Uh, a time of un uncertainty for, for other people, um, trying to understand and define the whole process of affirmative action, which was frustrating for other people and not so much maybe for others. And also uh, trying to deal with that for myself as well, that um, do you, what is it that people see when they look at you that uh, you are an affirmative action uh, product and is there anything wrong with that? Does that take away uh, your ability, your skill, that you're actually good at what you're doing as well? So it was things that I was battling with for myself that I wanted to understand. And through doing this work, I was hoping that I would get better understanding of what was happening, but also a better understanding <coughs> for myself as well. But part of the research was, not part of the academic space, the other is the sort of modeling space, which is also an attempt to sort of come to terms with that sort of dual identity. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. It was in, in looking at how the two are connected, if, if at all. And there, there, are a lot of there were a lot of frustrations for me in, 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 the, in the modeling industry, as well. a lot of challenges, um, a lot of frustrations, actually. Um, and, and that also that I, I wanted to, to understand and, and make sense of. And what, what kinds of uh, And the, the modeling industry is, is about performance. There's a lot of performance that, that takes place. And you, there's a lot of you having to, to be uh, something else or somebody else. And but also, it's, it's very, for me, it's a very political space as well, where um, people are treated differently uh, and are categorized differently according to race, you know, in, in the industry itself, uh, which can be very complex and very frustrating. I did most of my modeling jobs in Pretoria, and um, most of the girls that I worked with were white, and, and finding myself in that space and looking and just observing it, uh, observing the treatment and, uh, that one gets and um, what that means to me and how that could be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. A simple thing like uh, being late for a fashion show, mm -hmm. and um, if it's me who's late, um, it will be understood differently from if it's 
uh, you know, I don't know, a minder who is late. Um, and just trying to, to make sense of that and trying to see or understand um, what that means. And hence it says it's, uh, it's very, it cannot really be divorced from the politics <coughs> of race. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's interesting because in, in the academic world, the two things you, s you said that have fascinated me is that you know, one, in the academic world, we also have a system where there's a, there's a performance. Mm -hmm. and there's always this tension between the right kind of performance and the things you actually want to do in your authentic. Sort of mm -hmm. And there's the issue of race. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how did you negotiate in your early career those two things? The tension between having to make a particular kind of performance in the academic world mm -hmm. and the tension between that and your interests. And the other thing, being a, a young black uh, academic, you know, sort of, it's a psychology which traditionally is that I think it not just be white, but actually quite racist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think the performance continues for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's how I make it work, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I just I feel like I'm at a point where I was actually speaking to a colleague of mine um, when we had a, another conversation the other day, was also um, a psychology scholar, uh, that I'm at a point where I write what I like. I'm at a point where um, I'm not uh, going to compromise my views because um, having having certain views, obviously you know you need to um, support or substantiate or whatever that 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 which we live in and, and I'm at a point where I feel I can be able to do that and, and actually have that voice without um, being worried about having a voice and that helps me and, and that's part of the performance. Um, and on the other hand with, with the modeling industry I, I just stopped. Um, 95% stopped. Um, so the, with there, what I do again is also doing what I like. So what happens is just I just do direct jobs if somebody calls me for it. So I don't go out looking for things anymore. Yeah. So if somebody's interested in me doing something for them, I will go and do that. So it's it's now in my own terms, and that's where I came. And in the academic sphere, I mean, you say you're at a point where you have a voice, and, and, and but how does one get to that point where you where you can say how did you get to that point? I write what I like and I have a voice and I'm comfortable with that. Um, I think things like uh, publications uh, help in that. Uh, when, when you, in your academic journey, when you get to a point where um, you get your views across and one of the ways that you can do that is by writing, mm -hmm. by publishing. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're teaching, um, not teaching what's there in front of you, but actually create the material that you want to teach. Yeah. Um, is a way in which I feel you can insert your voice in, in the things that you're doing. Yeah. And I feel that I'm in, at that point. I mean, I'm in that space yeah. right now. So it's, it's actually quite interesting how it works sometimes where you say that, you know, like something like publication makes it possible for one to, to, to define one's voice. So it's weird. Where something or which is a performance makes it possible for you to, to become authentic for yourself. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, you, you said I write what I like, which is interesting because <laughs> it's like it's a it's a it's a steep ego quote. Yes, yes. Um, so um, I was wondering about it. So yeah, um, why why was it intentional that you went say with it? Um, I think. Because I read his book and um, it, it really spoke to me, yeah. and I and I, I draw I draw from his yeah. philosophy if you want, yeah. and um, so that whole notion of, of uh, I write what I like uh, for me and him saying that is is um, I have my my own voice my own mind my own ways of doing things, um, and and that's how I'm going to do things. That's that's what I'm going to practice. And in that, for me, it was as a metaphor of having your own voice and being able to utilize that voice, yeah. and whether you know, literally, like vocally using that voice, or by writing, yeah. which is another way of having your voice heard as well. So, and do you think that in, in psychology specifically, that that it, it's more than just because in reference to Vico, that it's more than just um, like as a black person or as a woman to have your voice heard in the existing thing, but that the existing thing itself has to 
<coughs> transformed or I believe the existing thing itself has to be transformed. Yeah. yeah. And, and how, what, what do you think should happen to psychology in South Africa? Should it Africanize or should it? Uh, you know, how would, how would psycho psychology look for you if you could uh, <laughs> if you could write, if you could make the decisions about uh, what we teach and how we think about psychology? I think of a psychology that takes seriously experiences of. Um, the people that it claims to speak about, the people that it claims to represent. Mm -hmm. um, if um, we draw a lot from from the West, we, we draw a lot from uh, theories that, that have been there for many, many years, and I believe there's something to be learned there. There's mm -hmm. something that we can draw from that, but that, that should not be the beginning and the end. Um, if if we, we're in this context, in, in Africa, we need to be teaching and speaking about the psychology that speaks to our own experiences, our own ways of knowing. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the psychology that I see. The one that, that's local, if you want, where, where it's, it can speak to the global world, but it should also be localized as well. Yeah. Um, and let me give an example. In, in, uh, in social psychology, we read of many um, theories uh, about behavior, about identity, about self. Uh, and one of the theories about, you know, pro-social behavior, you know, what, what, what is it that make people help or choose not to help? And um, there, there's an example that, that is given in one of the textbooks uh, that we prescribe, and it gives uh, a little story about a woman that was killed uh, and the eight people were watching and they didn't do anything, or witnessed rather, uh, the, the murder and they didn't report. And, and from that, um, you know, the curiosity of a person or um, a researcher saying, but what is it that makes people choose to help or not to help? But, um, so thinking of that in general terms, but the, the story that it, that has been used, the context of it, is actually something that happened elsewhere. It's uh, in a different context, and there could be reasons, and many reasons behind that. But somebody saw that and, and drew from that and thought about a theory about helping or not helping. And when you think about it in our context, would it still be the same? Would that would would we? Uh, coin it that way, would we explain it that way, would we, would we um, ask the same questions that, that the, th the theorists ask in that, in that context? I wonder. And I believe the only way that we can be able to find out or answer that is if we, if we, if we, if we look at it from here. And if we think about a similar story like that one, but from here. So, and then we need to, to rethink uh, the theories that are existing. It's almost like you know, this Mark Twain uh, quote that I read where he talks about the transformative power of travel. It's like psychology seems to travel around the world, mm -hmm. but not always really engaged with where it travels to and can be transformed. Um, just before we, 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 we go to your own travel <laughs> to the north, um, I just wanted to know, you, you, you talk about publication. Did you, did you publish from your, your master's? Uh, Research, or did that come later? Um, yeah, I did. I published. Um, um, yeah, I published two articles from from there um, from my master. Yeah. Uh, can you say something about the first publication? Was it particularly daunting, or difficult, or exciting? Yeah, it was daunting. <laughs> it was really, yeah, it was really daunting. Um, I sent, I put together a manuscript, and I sent it. Uh, out there, and it came back with the reviewers' feedback, and you know, there's potential, uh, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. You know, think about this, think about that, and um, I had to make a decision because um, getting negative feedback you know, is painful, and so I looked at that and I had to make the decision: do I do I rework it? Do I uh, listen to what they're saying? and see how I can rework it and, and send it, or do I just give up? And um, I chose to sit down with it and, and work on it, and then send it back, and um, then it was accepted. So that was, that was a learning curve for me. And, uh, how did it feel the first time you saw your 
you self in print. <sighs> That's right. <laughs> 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 you my outfit. And you said, it's a good feeling, isn't it? How does it feel? This is the beginning, you know? It gets better from here. And it was very encouraging. And it was a good feeling, like, wow. And this is something that other people can read. You know, other people can read what I have to say and maybe learn something from it or take something from it. So it, it was a good feeling. One does see oneself a little bit differently once you see yourself objectified there on the page. And mm -hmm. You trust yourself a little bit more. So. <laughs> True. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you work here for quite a few years and you finished your master's. So how did it come about that you ended up in New York doing a PhD? Because nobody said, here's the money you want to go. I, I completed my master's and then continued teaching. And then I started thinking about my PhD and, and wanting to do my PhD. Uh, at first, I was thinking that I was going to do it here, just like my, my master's and, and uh, register for my PhD and then start working on my PhD. And then there was an opportunity uh, to apply for a scholarship uh, to go and study psychology in the United States. And I thought, why not? Let me give it a try. The worst that could happen is they could say no. And, and so I applied for a scholarship um, and did the whole thing, application, interviews, showed this thing, and then uh, they, they felt that, yeah, they wanted me to go to that country. <laughs> what, what scholarship was it? Uh, the Fulbright. The Fulbright yeah. Did you particularly want the Fulbright, particularly want to go to the United States, or was it just because that was an opportunity that was available? Uh, it was because it was an opportunity that was available, yeah. And then how did it come about you that you chose the city of New York? Um, did, did you choose it? Or were, you, were you allocated for it? How did it work? No, no, no I chose it. Yeah. Uh, you're given an opportunity to choose three universities that you would like to study at. And uh, they, they do the application on, on your behalf. Everything is done on your behalf. You just send through whatever uh, paperwork that they require and they do all of that on your behalf. But uh, ending up at the City University of New York, shortly before I left, I, I was invited to go to... Um, <coughs> No, 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 Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was invited to go to Luxembourg. Uh, it was the following year, which year was it now? I can't remember. But the following year, uh, Freud would have turned 100 years. And so thinking about the future of, of psychology and uh, where psychology is going, uh, 10 scholars were invited from around the world to come and talk about the future of psychology, but also thinking about having um, a conference uh, to celebrate 100 years of Freud. And uh, so it was hoped that that meeting would also speak to uh, putting together that conference and what it could be about. And um, I was lucky enough to be invited to go to Luxembourg for that conversation. And it was there that I met uh, Amia Libler. Uh, and I was telling her about uh, my scholarship and going to the United States and that I'm still I'm looking at universities and looking at people that I, I would like to work with and I talked to her briefly about what I do and she told me about a professor called Michelle Fine and she said from what, from what uh, my interest seemed to be about Michelle Fine might be the person to work with uh, and that I should uh, consider. And, and so I googled Michelle Fine, looked at her work, looked at what she does uh, and I was very interested in the work that she does, and I felt that um, maybe that could be the person that I might want to work with. Um, and so she happened to be at the City University of New York. Yeah. So uh, in my application, I I mentioned the three universities: the, the City University of New York and, and other universities. That those those are my options. So you give them your options, and then they try to they apply there, but they apply at other universities as well. And they go through this vigorous selection process as well, where they, they, the university interviews you. It's like what we do with our master's uh, selections, because they also take you know a handful of PhD students sure. 
Yeah, so um, I was lucky that the City University was interested and uh, they called. We had uh, an interview over the phone and uh, Michelle said she would love to work with me. So, so at that stage, what, what was she doing that you found interesting? In the, the, the um, she, she does work, she does participatory action research and she, she's a, she, she works, she uses a feminist perspective to look at issues in social psychology. She's a, she's a critical social psychologist and, and that's how she approaches her work. She, she does a lot of work with women, uh, but specifically women in prison, but she also works with the youth in schools as well um, and the challenges that are happening there. So from, from that and from uh, the, the work that she did, I felt that um, I could learn something from that and uh, I could see myself uh, working with her and hopefully gaining a lot from what she has to offer. So how long were you there, the residential? How long did you, did you stay in New York? Three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that Sting song where he says, I'm an alien, so I'm an Englishman in New York? I know the song. <laughs> <laughs> you went an Englishman in New York, but did you also feel like an alien when you arrived? Or did you feel like well, the fact that they call you an alien, there's no way you're not going to feel like an alien. Yeah. That's very bizarre. Um, we call people other things in this country, but um, alien is something else. Yeah, in, in, in the US, we are not a US citizen, you're an alien. So I was an alien in New York for, uh, for three years. Yeah. But do you feel at home in New York? Only in my second year did I start warming up to the place. It was, it was quite a challenge at first. What, what was the main uh, challenge initially? That I had to speak English all the time yeah. was a huge challenge. I yeah, I had to, to get used to that. Yeah. And um, yeah, my my <laughs> my cohort, yeah, they were wonderful. Because at times I would just tell them I'm really tired of speaking English now and. So and they, 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 they understood. So that was one of, one of the challenges. And um, missing my family to bits was also another challenge. Um, and New York is another place. It can be really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. It's, it's got everything that you can think of. Um, people go there to, you know, with the hope of realizing their dreams. And for many of them, it, it doesn't happen, and they just find themselves lost in that deep space. Um, so having having to see that was was also yeah a bit sad, really. Yeah. So um, someone was saying maybe I should just be in New York and, and be a clinical psychologist and help all these people because I swear every second person that you meet. Doesn't look well. <laughs> Maybe I also didn't look well to some people as well, but yeah, that was my experience. And the psychology they do at the City University, did, did you get a sense that it's responsive to the, to the place in which it is located? Does it respond to sort of New York issues or you know, the sort of social issues there? Yeah. Or is it a typical sort of psychology that's removed from the world? No, not, not, not at my school. Yeah. And that's, that's something that. I really enjoyed and and, and 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 drew from when the, the the university where I went was amazing in that um, some of the fathers of psychology taught there, some of them you know studied there. Um, the 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 theory that I used for my masters in place identity of Prashansky, um, he was actually teaching there, but then way before, uh, yeah, uh, and just being in that space where he was, I think that was also one of the things that drew Michelle Fine to be like, wow, because they, they, they wanted to see the work that I did in my master's and had a look at that to also determine also whether they would like me to come in. She saw that I, I, I drew from Prashansky and she was saying, she, he was actually, yeah, he was in the environmental psychology mm -hmm. part and, and so it's exciting to see that, you know, uh, people out there actually you know, draw from our psychology and I was like, if only you knew, that's the psychology that we do, that your psychology is the psychology that we do. So, um, and Stanley Milgram, he, he, he was there as well and just being in that space with, with those spirits was, uh, was amazing. 
Um, but they they work a lot with with uh, the communities around. Uh, they 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 do work, which was something that was fascinating to me that with um, the government and, and the local communities, uh, my school was very involved, uh, and and that for me spoke to actually the social issues, bringing them into the class and then from the class going out yeah. into the community as well, and we actually had some of the the people also coming in. We had brown bag sessions every week yeah. where we talk about our work, uh, where people share their research as well. And in those spaces, uh, we get people from the community also talking about being part of the research. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. And the program in which you were um, registered, was it the social psychology program or community psychology? Um, it, it's social and personality psychology, okay. yeah. So we're looking at the personal and the, and the collective, so the, yeah. the, yeah, the individual and the collective and how the two can really be separated. So when you're talking about self, uh, it's always self in relation, and not self in isolation. Uh, just before I left, there was uh, a facelift that was happening, and uh, so the program is now called Critical Social Psychology Program. It's quite unique for the United States. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was a coursework. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about the coursework, the stuff you had to do, and so on? Um, it's, it's, you need 60 credits, yeah. which should be about, which should take you about three years yeah. to complete. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's coursework for three years that you need to do before you can move into the dissertation stage. Okay. Yeah, so um, we, we revisited some of the, the personality uh, theories, uh, which was very interesting to me, because it was not only about the work that they did, but we actually went and, and studied uh, the people themselves. Okay. So uh, if, if we're talking about um, Jung for, you know, for interest. So we go back to, to the life, who he was, where he was born, how did he grow up, and how did he end up in the field that he did. So it, 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 it offered a lot of background in, into the people that, that um, we were studying about, which was, which was good, which was really good. And, uh, and a lot of research courses as well, uh, quant and qual that, that we did, and then we did um, for personality, you did study of lives. Uh, and what other courses did I do? There's a, a, and a lot of seminar courses as well. The, the program is divided into sub, sub programs. So my program is social and personality. And then there's developmental psychology. So there are people doing their PhDs in developmental psychology. And then there's environmental and neuro. So it's many, it's, it's 11 sub disciplines. So we, we all attend our classes uh, individually, but then there are times where we attend together, especially for research methodologies. So it, it offered space also for the, the, the conversations across the sub-disciplines, but also we're allowed to take electives. So we could take courses in sociology, in anthropology, uh, in African studies, so whatever other courses that you wanted to do, you were allowed to do that as well, uh, which, was, which was good. So this was like the first time in quite a few years that you were a full-time student. Yeah, yeah. Was that uh, I, I think I think that's, uh, that's actually what drew me to, to applying for a scholarship, because it was going to offer me an opportunity to really, for the first time, be a full-time student. Yeah. Um, there were opportunities um, while I was there to teach, yeah. and I refused. Okay. Uh, I refused to teach. Um, I, I I stood in for people just yeah. to get a sense uh, of you know the classroom and what it's like. So teaching undergrad students, but only helping out here and there. But I I just I refused to to take up that class because I felt it was an opportunity for me to be a full time student, and that's what I'm going to do, and that's what I did. Yeah. If you had to single out something that like the most rewarding thing about the coursework part of the degree, what would you, what would you say? Hmm. Sure, one thing. Or two. <laughs> <laughs> um, I 
being able to make decisions for yourself um, as a student, being trusted enough that um, you can be able to do what you set out to do um, was was fantastic for me. And and another thing that really stood out for me was being given an opportunity to <laughs> being given an opportunity to to talk about your research uh, so many times. Yeah. So so many times. We talked about our work to a point where you know I felt that if 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 I were to be sick tomorrow and my work had to be presented by someone, anyone in my class was going yeah. to be able to talk about my work. That's how much we, yeah. we engaged and, and really lived the research that, that, that we wanted to do. So yeah. that for me was an amazing, amazing thing that um, I would like to see happening here on the fifth floor. That's the next thing I was wondering how, how your experience of, of, of being the change the way you think about yourself being a supervisor or a lecturer? Yeah. Um, it, I, had, I had an amazing supervisor, mentor, friend, all the wonderful words mm -hmm. I can put there. And, and I, I, I looked at her and many times what I was thinking was, I want to be a mini Michelle. I want to be a mini Michelle. Uh, for what this woman is, is, is doing and from what I'm learning from her, that's that's the kind of supervisor I would like to be for my students as so well. I would like my relationship with my students to be uh, a relationship uh, that goes beyond me saying, uh, go change this paragraph or go change that paragraph, to, to a point where we really engage with the work together uh, where I go an extra mile to really make sure that, because it can be a very lonely uh, journey experience, especially here at home, because when you're doing your research, it's just you yeah. and the library, it's just you and the books. Mm -hmm. And then if you're lucky, you can once in a while meet with your supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to really uh, offer to my students what is offered to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, your research, we should uh, ask you, what was your PhD dissertation about? My PhD dissertation was about black women in South Africa. I yeah. uh, was looking at the experiences of women who grew up during apartheid uh, and moving from apartheid to now, and you know how that speaks to one another and uh, their experiences of of that journey for them. Um, so it was uh, life stories of women. But I was linking this to the whole notion of suffering, that uh, people suffered a lot uh, during apartheid, and whether post-94 uh, that just stopped, or what happened to that. Mm -hmm. And I was specifically looking at um, women, because um, I feel that in, in, in psychology, we don't really use gender as a lens or a unit of analysis when we do work, but also in a broader historical background, when we look at the texts that are out there, women's voices are, are missing. You know, it's almost as if um, they didn't play a role uh, in, in, where we, in, in getting us to where we are today. And so I was interested in looking at, yeah, the relationship between um, suffering, pain, and um, how that speaks to people being able to express that pain, and how we look at it in psychology. Um, so I draw a little bit from, or I critique a little bit, uh, the, the way in which suffering is understood in psychology, and how we quick to pathologize and, and just medicalize people's pain and how we should understand that um, it's suffering is intergenerational, suffering um, is gendered, uh, suffering is, is, is or, or cannot be divorced from, um, from politics, from history, uh, you know, race and, 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 and class, and how all those things 
combined, um, define people's everyday lived experiences. And so that that was my work. So I I drew from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I did a bit of a secondary um, data analysis of that in looking at um, the commission itself, how it came about, what it aimed to do, and the role that women played uh, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the challenges that came with that, which led to the, the special hearings for women and why there had to be a special hearing for women uh, that, that had to take place. So, so drawing from that and looking at women's experiences, um, yeah, I, I, I spoke about how we understand or uh, can uh, understand suffering or redefine our, our understanding of what trauma is. So in that way, um, again, my fascination with language, how language is used. In psychology, we talk a lot, right? It's me and you, and we're talking, and I want to understand your experiences. But I, I also agree that um, when we're talking about suffering, it's, it's a very embodied experience as well, that we can speak about our experiences, but sometimes when we, oh, so speaking cannot be enough, or is not be, is not enough. So we need to think of alternative ways in which people can ex express uh, their suffering. So I, I started thinking of uh, alternative ways in which people can be able to do that. And so I worked with a group of women here in South Africa, uh, talking about their, their experiences um, of growing up during apartheid, mm -hmm. and decided to make embroideries mm -hmm. or express uh, their stories uh, through embroideries, mm -hmm. uh, as an addition to, be, to, to talking about their life stories, with the hope that some of uh, the embodied pain could be expressed in the visual uh, way, in a visual way, through the embroideries that they made. And so I worked with them for a couple of months where they created these embroideries. And, and how did you, how did you, did you interpret the embroideries? Did you get them to talk about it, or how did you? How did you um, I got them to to talk about uh, the embroideries. So uh, it it was a process, yeah. you know. It took a couple of months, and but then I met with them regularly, mm -hmm. so as to check how it's going, because it wasn't an easy thing. Uh, for them, so they told me, um, but it also having to sit and, and make these embroideries uh, gave them a chance to really revisit the past, and and it brought back a lot of things that they they had buried somewhere yeah. deep, and and having to make these embroideries forced them to revisit and go to that space that they did not want to go to. And making these embroideries in their own homes, wherever they, they felt comfortable making their embroideries, also allowed space, them space to have conversations uh, with their children about something that they would have never thought about telling their children about in, in making those embroideries and, and talking to them about those embroideries. So at the end, um, we, we then spoke about the process, and they spoke about what's in the embroideries. So for me, that, that embroid the, the embroideries uh, are an extension of uh, what they, they, they told me, but they also allow space for multiple interpretations. Because if I take their life stories, I'm going to give meaning to those stories. This is what I'm hearing, these are the themes, this is what's coming out here. But then if I put those embroideries in addition to those stories, mm -hmm. then they, it allows space also for multiple interpretations of, of what's there. Mm -hmm. and, and the visual part of it as well in terms of how they use color and how they choose to use color uh, also uh, lends itself to way, many ways of, of giving meaning to their stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So that sort of does, because in psychology we're quite conservative around now, even in we think about qualitative methods as sort of uh, people in qualitative methods often think we're doing the, the cool progressive stuff, but right. quite narrow as well in uh, verbal focus mm. and so on. Mm. So would you now also motivate students to, to explore other kinds of ways of capturing experiences and so on beyond traditional interview based? Research? Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I'm hoping to do. And uh, something that I did also is I felt that um, 
by 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 deciding on taking excerpts from from the interviews, um, uh, I've been losing out on a lot. That that's something. It's always a challenge. Um, because you, you have a topic, and so obviously you go there with the aim that I'm interested in exploring the, you know, the, the experiences. So I'll be looking at what the experiences are and what I'm hearing from that. So it's, it's very subjective, and so you know, research is very subjective. So you take excerpts from, from the work, and you say, this is what she said, and, and from here, this is, this is what I'm hearing, and this is the theme that's coming out. Um, and I, I decided not to choose to do that. Uh, and so what I did is I, I put the, the whole stories in the, in, in, in the entirety uh, in, in, the, in the dissertation. I, it's like by, by taking a paragraph here and a paragraph there and a paragraph there um, is putting the, their stories and putting their lives apart, which is you know how we, we traditionally do it. Because yeah. uh, sometimes people give you pages and pages and pages. So how do you do? You need to make a decision. So uh, for the the dissertation, I said I'm making this decision uh, of putting the whole story, the whole narrative, here, yeah, and in in addition to the embroideries that they're making. Because if I just choose part of it, then there's a lot that's going to be lost. So. That's how I chose to do it. And 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 um, do you, do you think do you feel like what well, that we have sort of obligations to our research participants beyond the, the, the ethical issues that we have to fill out on forms? You know, some kind of obligation to 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 the, to the people we study. Yeah, I do. I, I, I do. I, I even the uh, the ethical forms themselves are very restrictive. Yeah. You know, uh, in in the rules. I understand that institutions have to protect themselves. Yeah. It's more about, in my opinion, I know this is being recorded. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more about uh, the institutions protecting themselves yeah. uh, as much as we would like to claim that it's about you know, yeah. uh, the participants and, and respecting yeah. the participants yeah. and all of that. But when you look at the gains and, yeah. and you know, losing of it, I feel like the institutions gain more uh, yeah. than the participants yeah. are gaining in, in the way in which we're restricted yeah. in what and how we can yeah. do it. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's a struggle really, like how do you strike a balance? Because yeah. at the end of the day, uh, there has to be those uh, ethics so that people just don't go out there and yeah. do research and cause a lot of harm. But also, how do we, or where do we draw the line? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like you know. You also have a. Uh, I often think about those ethics applications. It, it, it provides us with a way out to, to to keep on thinking about a relationship with our participants because that's been sorted out. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think it's an important thing, I suppose, to to keep on problematizing our relationship with, with those we do research yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. If you had to, um, now look back at uh, at Yenisa in Pretoria, what, you, what what is the thing you miss most about? Missed miss most about being in New York. <laughs> <laughs> what are you nostalgic about? Uh, I hope it doesn't sound nerdy, but I miss the school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I miss the sixth floor. Yeah, the, my department was on the sixth floor, mm -hmm. and I miss uh, the engagement that uh, we had mm -hmm. on the sixth floor and the spaces that, that we created, which were very, very enriching. Um, yeah, that's what I miss. Uh, the, the friends that I made yeah. in New York, I miss them. Yeah. And now that you're a doctor, uh, are you, uh, what are you looking forward to in the immediate future? Academically. Academically? Yeah. What are your plans? Uh, Publishing a book yeah, from okay. my dissertation, right. that's the next plan, big plan, big project. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, my dissertation is being read yeah. somewhere right now with the possibility. So, it's a lot of work, yeah. I think, um, if they say, yeah, let's take on this project. So, that, that's where I'm going next. That's wonderful. Right, this suck.
so much more that we can talk about. Such a fasc fascinating research journey that you've uh, and personal journey that you've done. But I think our time is sort of up. It was been rudely shown signs. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening to us. Thank you for that. Thank you. Our side. Thank you. It's sort of time for tea. Can I suggest, if it's okay with the two of you, we have a tea break and when we come back, we continue. So if there's any questions, because it can sort of lead us into a discussion on interviews. Okay. So we first like a break, have tea for half an hour, come back if you have any questions to this. <laughs>